Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, we, last week we did something that's a little strange. We're between starting making transition into this new year, 2019. And I wanted to go back to the very root of what In, Christ, in Search of Christianity is all about. What is Christianity all about? Mm. So we did something last week, which is up online now, and I wanted to kind of fill in on that today by asking the question, what is our faith? What is Christianity? What is this? What is the church? What is... Uh, what are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> we might have to redefine the things that we thought we knew. Well... If you've ever read the Sermon on the Mount, you'll understand that Jesus Christ asked the church, asked the believers mm -hmm. to rethink everything Absolutely. that they were doing. Yeah. And if we are, as Paul says in Romans, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that means we have to, we have to change the way we think. And it's not for us to lean on our own understanding, mm -hmm. but it's for us to be led by the Holy Spirit into thinking differently mm -hmm. than we did in the past. So that's what we're going to talk about today talking about what the church is, what Christianity is. You know, Paul wrote to the believers in Corinth, and I want to read to you from uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read the first three verses. Paul said to them, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. The simplicity. The simplicity. Religion, I think, is understood by almost everybody, although everybody seems to have a different understanding of religion. I mean, ask... Ask a hundred people, ask a hundred quote-unquote Christians what Christianity is, what church is, what religion is. And I think without doubt you get more than a hundred different answers. And I'm not being facetious. Mm. Because religion as it is understood by most people, whatever, however they understand it, is without doubt complex in the extreme rather than simple. Okay, it's Religion is always, complexity is its character. Mm. It's filled with the tradition of men. It's filled with the rituals, relics, and rules that are not the heart nor the desire of God. That's typical of man-made religion, okay? The Word of God defines religion, and it does define... Yes, God. it does. Now, by the way, but let, me, let me take a second and say this. Mm -hmm. Everything I'm going to say, my, my, all my belief stems from the Word of God, right. okay? Not from the Tradition. doctrines of men, not from the traditions of men, not from the doctrines of the churches. So it, it, you, if you can accept that, if you can accept that the word of God is, as it claims to be, pure and holy, mm. it is that which is God has given us to, to lead us. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, okay? Mm -hmm. If you can get that, then if I say something <clears throat> that you don't agree with, Please test it, but test it according to the Word of God. And if you find something different in the Word of God than what I'm saying, please contact me right away at office at BibleTalk.com and let me know. I am not and make no claims to being perfect. Okay? The Word of God is the only standard that we It is the only standard use. that God accepts, mm -hmm. and it's certainly the only standard that I accept. Right. The unfortunate part is, in most Christian religions, the Word of God has been replaced by the traditions of men. Right. Okay? Okay. But here's how the Word of God defines religion. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. James 1.27. That's it. That's it. Visit widows and orphans and keep yourself unstained. 
How hard is this? What, what, is it, what exactly does God want? You get your Bible, do me a favor and open to Micah chapter 6 and tell me what God desires. She'll get there. And thank you that patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay, can I do it? Yeah. Six, six? Probably. Okay. With what? Sh do you have it? I didn't stop looking for it. What does God require of you, O man? I can tell you. Okay, Allison's going to tell us. To love, mercy, do justice, and walk humbly with your God. That sounds pretty simple. Yes. His desire has always been that we're with him. It's to be in the presence of God. I mean, David knew that. He said, it's not about burnt offerings and everything. It's just, it's about being in the presence of God. Church is, and this is my definition, challenge it if you will, the gathering, a gathering of believers of any number. Believers, okay? Because Jesus said, if two or more of you gather in my name, there I am in your midst. Mm -hmm. This is church. This is church. It doesn't require a building. It doesn't require special clothing. It doesn't require, I mean, you dress up special or do the, it's a gathering of believers. In the early church, this is the example, they met day by day, house to house, in for fellowship, for prayer, for the teaching of the apostles and for the breaking of bread. Yes. That's church. How did it get to be that it's all about these massive cathedrals and buildings Massive mega churches and the programs and the programs. I mean, I, I'll tell you that I've had the opportunity. Alice and I have traveled all over Europe. We've been in Central America, South America, Mexico. You go there, the cathedrals. It all kind of tends from its Catholic roots, Roman Catholic roots. But you see these cathedrals. Cathedrals, they're they're full of dead men's bones, but there's no life. I mean, they're just they're empty tombs. And, and the, the human cost, forget the financial cost, the human cost that went into the building of those things is reprehensible. Because please bear this in mind and check it out. God said he will not live. He will not dwell in a house built by the hands of man, period. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it says that, right? So people that talk about you walk into a house and they say, walk into a church building and they say, welcome to the house of the Lord. They're lying to you. It's not. No, it isn't. The only building that God will dwell in is the one that he's building with living stones. And that's us. That's it. We need to get back to the root. We need to get back to the root of what Christianity is, what our relationship with God is. Well, that's what I want to talk about, right? Right. Because people are deceived. And when I say people, I'm talking about those who call themselves Christians. They are deceived as to what the church is, what Christianity is. Jesus Christ did not come to this planet to start a new religion. He did not. He came to restore an old relationship. The relationship was the fellowship that man had with God in the garden. And what happened to that? It was broken. And you know how it was broken? It was broken by religion. Yes. Because the serpent came along and said to Eve, the first thing he did was to challenge the word, as God really said, and then told Eve that she could make herself like my God mm -hmm. by doing what, you know, doing something, something that happened doing to be against kind of the command of God. Yeah. yeah but, and and that, that was, that's what religion always says. It's about what you do. It's about your works that make you right with God. Well, the result of that was they were totally separated from God. Mm -hmm. Sin separates you from God. Let me. Behold, the Lord, Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot say, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your sin, have set, made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Sin separates you from God. So after the fall, after... Adam and the woman sinned, right? Total, total separation from God. Christianity is, write this down. Mm -hmm. Christianity is simply 
A family affair. Amen. It's a family affair. This all started with God telling Abraham, right? I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to, and it went from, you know, he, God is, is well pleased to be known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You want to know who Jesus is? Go to the beginning of the gospel, you know, and you'll see a genealogy that shows you the family that Jesus comes mm -hmm. from, that establishes his, his place, all right? It's a family. It's a family of God. It's not about a denomination. It's not about, you know, the church building. It's not about an organization. It never has been. It is about being the family of God. This is how you know who the family of God is. In Luke 8, 19, you know, let me read this from Matthew first. Okay. In, in Matthew 12, 46, it says, while he, Jesus, was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, behold, your mother and brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my mother, my brother and sister and mother. It's about doing the will of God. Doing the will of the father makes you a child of God, makes you part of the family of God. That's how Jesus, he didn't say, well, let me see your birth certificate. No. It's he didn't simple. say, you know, yeah. what synagogue do you go to? It's about, you know, who will do, hear God's voice and do. And, and you know, that's Jeremiah. We've been doing a, a Friday night Bible study in Jeremiah, Friday night on Thursday night. And God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah and he said this, For I did not speak to your fathers, or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in all the way which I command you, that it may be well with you. It's about hearing his voice and obeying his commands. That's what it's about. Again, very simple. Absolutely very simple. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. It's not... It's not the way you dress. It's People talk about how hard the Levitical law was. I mean, how many laws? How many laws? How many, how many Levitical laws were, you know? That's right, a Six, lot. 600 and something. Yeah. Think you are, yeah. Not nearly as many as the Roman Catholic Church has established as the canon laws. Thousands. <laughs> Twice as many. Twice as many. Yeah. You see, it was never about what things, what works we did that could make us right with God. Mm. It was, and it still is, about what he did, right? What did he did? Not good English, but good theology coming. I'll tell you what God did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave Jesus Christ. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. That's what the father did. That was the thing he did, is he gave his son Christ Jesus, because nothing else could help. No man can by any means redeem his brother. The cost is it's too costly. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. No Jesus, no salvation, no righteousness, no hope. And that's why he's given each and every one of us the ministry of reconciliation. Yes, but think about this now. God the Father, what he did was to give his son Jesus Christ. To reconcile us. What Jesus Christ did was to give all. Give all. That's what he did. He gave all. Mm -hmm. um, have this attitude in yourselves, Paul wrote to the Philippians, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. 
So God the Father did something, and Jesus mm. did something. It wasn't a matter of Jesus. It was, you know what he said? He didn't want to do it. No. Because he, he came to the earth as truly God, but truly man. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to, I mean, he knew what lie ahead of him when he was facing that cross. That's right. But he said, nevertheless, nevertheless, thy will be done. Thy will be done. That's Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's the imitation of Christ. Nevertheless, thy will be done. It's not about what you want. It's about fulfilling God's will in your life. Almighty God had made a promise to do what we could not do to restore the right relationship. Okay? He made that promise long ago. I mean, the first thing I talk about family and Abraham, the first thing was Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain right. and being willing to offer him as a sacrifice unto God. And God said, no, I'll provide the sacrifice. Not Isaac, your son, but that was foretelling, foreshadowing that God said, I will provide my son, the perfect, pure Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. But back in the prophet Isaiah, mm -hmm. God spoke to Isaiah and said, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth, and everyone who is called by my name, and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. And then he goes on in that chapter, Isaiah 43, and says, I, even I, this is God speaking, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. That was Isaiah 43, 5 through 7, and then verse 25. Did you notice something in there? God says, he'll bring my sons, my daughters, mm, those who are called by my name. The family. It's a family affair. Mm. My last name is McDaniel. That's because that's my family. Your name is Swipe. That's your family. We are called by the name of God because that's our family. From the beginning, the restoration, the reconciliation was based on bringing the family back together. Not to make a new church, not to make a new organization. So could, would you say that then the family name is Christians? I would say, well, now, by the way, Christians, just for your information, is uh, I think only appears three times in the entire Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And I think two of those times it's applied by somebody else outside. Right. Okay. okay? Yeah. Peter one time calls believers Christians. Um, not, not that there's the word church, by the way. The word church comes from an old German word that means the house of the Lord. So if you think that the building standing on the corner is the house of the Lord, well, remember what I just said a minute ago. God said, I will not live. I'm not, I'm not going to live in that house. I'm going to live in you. And if you don't understand that, and if you don't believe that, and shame on the churches that don't proclaim that, you will begin to act differently inside the building when you're there than you do outside the building. And your life will be hypocrisy. One thing one day, another thing another day. It is and always has been about love. Christianity is about love. If you wanted to describe Christianity in, in a word, in a single word, love is the word. Would you not buy that? Absolutely. Because it's not about the works. Religion is about the works. It's about you got to be here, you got to tithe, you got to go this, you got to do this ceremony, you got to do that. Christianity is about love. It's not about the works. It's not about the rituals. It's not about the religious trappings. None of that matters in the least. Love matters. Paul wrote this, and this is the most beautiful comment or commentary on love. I mean, from 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but to not have love, I'm nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. It's not about the stuff you do. It's about the God of love that you bear within you. And it's about his love welling up inside you. That's the first fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. 
It's his love that's been poured into you. And that love enables you to be a Christian. For the love of God has been poured into you through the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul wrote, right? The work that we have to do has been revealed in the words of Jesus Christ. God never asks you to do anything that he doesn't equip you for. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't tell you to do this, but not tell you how to do it, right? Because you're not supposed to lean on your own understanding. What work are we supposed to do? Therefore they said to him, said to Jesus, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. John 6, 28 and 29. Jesus did the work. Mm -hmm. not, you know what you need to do? You need to give him thanks and praise. You need to rejoice in what he has done for you that you couldn't do for yourself. Jesus did all of the work, but we have to accept it. Mm -hmm. right? Wasn't that part of John 3, 16? So whosoever, you know, you know, we've got to receive it, right? Receive it, yeah. We have to humble ourselves. Realizing that we cannot make ourselves right with God. You can't make yourself right with God. There's nothing we can do. You can't go to church often enough. You can't tithe enough. You can't you can't do anything to make yourself right with God the Father. Jesus did it all. And I'll tell you what, you better be very, very careful that you get that straight. You can't make yourself right with God. That's the great lie of what's called usually called religion, mm -hmm. right? The works. Doing the, the, works. the works. Because the word of God. Now, this goes back. You believe the scriptures or you do not believe the scriptures. For Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Even faith is a gift from God. Right? Yes. If you think in any way, shape, or fashion, that you are earning salvation, earning righteousness through what you're doing, here is the most likely result. And this is what you have to think about, okay? Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7, 21 and 23. They come to Jesus Christ on that day, bragging, boasting mm -hmm. in what they have done. And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me. But did you notice? What did Jesus say? He who does the will of my Father. Isn't that what he said? Yes. Didn't that take you back to where we started? The family of God? Mm -hmm. Who are my brothers and sisters and mother? He who does the will of my Father. It's about, it's it's about, about doing what God the Father wants in your life. How do, how do you know what God the Father wants in your life? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. Everything that you need to know. And I'm telling you, it is the Spirit of God that leads you, not in the letter of the law, but in the Spirit of the law, to find the love of God and how God wants to work through you to spread that love. Mm. To spread the, That's why he has poured his Holy Spirit into you. That's why you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, so that the love of God can be manifest in you and touch other lives, so that the, the peace of God that passes all understanding will be there as a witness and a testimony of the, of the love of the Father in your life. So that the joy will be there. Listen, we live in a very unjoyful world. And by the way, America is one of the, not, not a joyful country. I'm going to say particularly in this, in this day and age. But the simple fact of the matter is, I, on a list of the top joyful nations, America is down here somewhere, and Britain is right below it. Boom, boom, boom. You, you, you want happiness? You're looking for happiness? The pursuit of happiness? Forget pursuing happiness. Joy is what God has, desires to give you. Joy that is not affected by circumstance, by trials or tribulations, not by any kind of circumstance. It is rock solid in your life because you are founded on the rock and your everything in your life is founded on that rock. That rock. Yes. Hallelujah. Higher than I. It is higher than I.
And if we're not operating in the spirit, we will be operating in the flesh. Baptism is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not a believer in infant baptism because you know you got to know what you're doing when you do it. But the simple fact, fact of the matter is, what you need to do, what you must do, what you absolutely must do, is you must be born again. Amen. Jesus Christ said to a to a Pharisee who had come to him in the night, Nicodemus. Yes. And Jesus said to him. You must be born again. Nicodemus didn't understand that, but Jesus explained it. Mm -hmm. Because the fact of the matter is, you were born in sin. That's right. And, the, and, and if you are still in the flesh, if you're not a child of God, then you're a child of Adam. Mm -hmm. And as a child of Adam, those curses of Adam are passed on generation after generation after generation, right down to you. Mm -hmm. You are set free from that when you change fathers. There is no such thing as a generational curse for a no, Christian. No. Because your father has no cur no curse to, curse pass, to on. pass on to you. All he has to pass on to you is righteousness. Right. Please take time. Pray about this. Stop and think about it. What is this faith? What is this religion? What is this Christianity that you are living and practicing? Is it about your love affair with Jesus Christ? Is it about the fact that you, you, know, you are now a child of God? Or is it about that building that you go to on Sundays? Your membership with the building. It's not about being part of a denomination. It's about being part of a family. Mm -hmm. And if you if you don't get that, you're being deceived by the devil, who is a father of lies. And you don't want to be deceived by the father of lies, no. because you want to, you don't want to be rudely, rudely awakened on that on day, day of judgment. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We need to examine how religious we are. Because religion is visiting widows and orphans and keeping yourself unstained in the world. We need to examine ourselves. Let a man examine himself, Paul says, a couple of times. Are we depending on what we do? Or are we depending on our salvation and our right relationship with God the Father on what Jesus Christ did? These are important questions. Yes. Don't be deceived. There's an, there's an old saying, somebody said once, that Christianity started as a fellowship in Jerusalem. It became a philosophy in Greece. It became a culture in Rome. And it became a business in the United States. That's right. Big business. Big business. Get right with God the Father and rejoice in the fact that you're a child of God. For you want to know something? Paul wrote that in Romans 8. And that is the thing I want to end on. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and that you can call out Abba, Father. Nothing else matters besides that. And Father, we just thank you so much that when we had strayed, when we were out there in sin, that you sent your Son into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. And lost we were and to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to bring us back into a right relationship with you. Father, help us to know and understand that relationship. Help us to live it with all of our beings, Lord God. Help us to love you with all of our mind, our heart, our soul, our strength. And help us to be faithful witnesses to the work of your Son, Christ Jesus. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome back now. Bye.